Good morning. Don't you like that? You just, you sit there and you smile if you forget to bring your intro into the show, right? There they are. There's my dad's chickens. Hello, dad. It's good to see you. He watches on YouTube and I hope that you do as well. Go to the Caffeinated Cooper Show channel on YouTube. Press the bell, subscribe, like, comment, share, it is fully interactive. I see we already have people connected. They are chomping at the bit to talk to J.M. Valente, which is connected to us. He is in Boston. I hope it's uh, not too chilly up there, but it, it very well could be. Let me tell you, it is balmy. It is like weirdly hot here in the Southeast. I mean, like our days are 75 plus. Like what? It, it's the end of December. We should never ever be this warm. It's kind of scary because there's a cold front uh, coming and it's going to bring some severe storms and then chill us down, which which I really wouldn't mind, right? Like I, I'm a Northeastern girl, so I always had cold Christmases, snowy Christmases. And here in North Atlanta, we do get all four seasons, which is really, really nice. So I do get my colder Christmases, but not this year. And I'm like, man, I need a deep freeze. Give me 14 days of like 17 degrees. As much as I hate the cold, you know what's going to happen? It's going to kill all of our bugs. Our bugs are like gigantic here. I, I, I can't even explain it. All right, let's shout out to our sponsor this morning, Honey Stinger. Honey Stinger is a really interesting product. Season two, they joined us and they're still one of our sponsors. It is, let's see. We have a few products here. Some are caffeinated, some are not. They have the strope waffles. These strope waffles are really, really nice. They're not too high in calories. It's about 150 calories I'm seeing peeking through on these packages here. That one's upside down. But they do have protein in them. This one is a honey flavor. The other one is vanilla. Now, this product is super cool. These are the gels. So are you a cyclist? Are you a long distance cyclist or a long distance marathon runner? These are great because you literally, you're still cycling, you're still running, you rip it open, you suck it and it's pure honey. So it's gonna give you a wonderful uh, 100 calories per packet a wonderful tasting. This is flavored honey. It's fruit smoothie. The other one is a gold natural honey flavor. I've used them in the gym before because I am hypoglycemic. So I really have to make sure as I burn my energy that I'm replacing it with sugar. I'm one of those people that literally can live on cookies. I, I don't know, uh, but I can. And it's really weird because the body shouldn't work like that. Here's the energized product. This one I've also used out in the gym. These are the energy chews. Um, six chews, 100 calories, not, not packed with a ton of sugar. They're gluten-free. It's all naturally sourced sugar, of course, because it's honey stinger, right? Get it, honey stinger. No artificial sugars. Um, so the strawberry kiwi and chocolate gels. Ooh, they have chocolate, but I wasn't sent the chocolate one. How yummy is that? 32 milligrams of caffeine. And they get it from the cola nut extract. So there again, you're not going to have that bitter, nasty, artificial caffeine flavor because it's not artificial. It's naturally sourced. Um, honey Stinger is organic wildflower honey. It's a product of Brazil. You can get 15% off today if you go to honeystinger.com. Let me bring that information up to the broadcast so that you can go and write that down. And visit it later because you're going to stay connected while we talk to J.M. Valente, who is coming up to the broadcast next. Purchase Honey Stinger on honeystinger.com. That's H-O-N-E-Y-S-T-I-N-G-E-R.com. Also, Amazon, Walmart, and the Vitamin Shop, if you have one near you. All right, everybody. So I have a super cool guest. He, This is a reunion show for him. He was on the show, I believe, in season one. He was back on the show in season four. And now we are almost into season six. Can you believe that? I can't believe that. I truly can't. It has been a huge blessing 
I have said in radio interviews and other podcasts and interviews and whoever will allow me to yak on their show, which I love doing. I mean, I can have a full conversation between me and the wall, not a problem, me and the dog. We have some really intellectual conversations while the kids are at school. Um, and I, I say all the time that this show, I started up to stay relevant because in the entertainment industry, if you're not on the big screen, you have to stay relevant. And this show has taken off without me. And then I caught up to it. And now here we are in a nice big studio. I have a full wardrobe. I have people that can help if I need help for some of the bigger shows. It, it's amazing. It really is. And it's a huge blessing. And I'm very, very thankful. So J.M. Valente, he is the author of the very, very popular Blood Passion novels. They are available for sale on Amazon. They're also available at Barnes Noble. They're at Books A Million. Honestly, you can walk into any bookstore and say, I need the Blood Passion series, all four books by J.M. Valente, and they will order them for you. Um, he is going to talk to us about the volume one, which actually has book one, two, and three within it, and book four, and maybe beyond maybe we could talk about a little bit of his plans for the beyond book four so without any further ado i'd like to welcome to the broadcast author jm valente how are you well good afternoon everybody it is uh, the weather where i am is nice for winter time it's kind of strange up here in new england but we've got a sunny day it's in the high 30s we don't have any snow on the ground. It's which Boston. is okay with me because you have to move snow, and I don't like moving it. You know what? I saw a wonderful to that note. I saw a wonderful video over the weekend. And I, I shared it because you know I do the chronically funny Facebook group, and if you like funny things, join chronically funny. We'll let you into the group. Just about anybody, right? And it was somebody clearing their driveway packed with snow everywhere with a flamethrower. Okay. Yeah. It's an idea. That's not good for the driveway. <laughs> you'll, do, you'll, do more, you'll do more damage than good because you're going to have to redo your driveway when you get done. But I can I mean, understand. you're better off. I mean, there's, there's the new, there's, a, I've been interested in this, this new thing that's out there now. It's called the snow Joe and it's cordless snow removing equipment. They have electronic snow shovel and electronic um, cordless snow blower, and the prices are pretty decent. But I already have a snow blower, uh, which thankfully I haven't had to use this year yet. You know the problem with snow blowers they don't do side they don't do stairs. Ah. But this new this new snow Joe stuff they have an electronic shovel that you can do stairs with, so you don't have to lift anymore. It's yeah. just push. Because that's, that's what really gets, when it comes to snow, it's the lifting that hurts people. Yes, absolutely. Especially that wet snow. It's really, really heavy. Oh. And that's so and interesting. And you have to the lift. Technology. And most people, they don't know how to lift properly. Mm, mm. You know, they um, bend over and they've even now got, you know, the new shovels with the different kind of stem on them that makes you be able to stand up straight and shovel. Sure. Because bending over is what really hurts people and causes problems. Oh, it does. We have um, a couple of people I mean, connected this morning. We have Damon King is saying uh, congratulations on your book release, and he can't wait to hear more. We're going to get into that in just a moment, Damon. And Jane, she's in New Mexico. She's saying that they're getting their first snow flurry in New Mexico today. Yeah. Michael Schwartz, he is out in Oregon. Uh, we had snow for days here in Oregon. Isn't it interesting? It's, it's a very different winter, I'll tell you that. But let's get into Blood Passion. Now, you are a near and dear friend of the show. You've been on before, and we've talked about the Blood Passion series. Tell us, uh, let's start with Volume 1, because we didn't have Volume 1 where all three books were in one volume before. Tell us about that. Well, volume one, which I have in my hands, was created for, for one main reason. The publisher of book one and two went out of business. Mm. And I learned the hard way that when a publisher goes out of business, 
print copies are no more available. No, they're no longer available. You can't order print copies. You can get, and like, thank God I put them on the e, you know, the Kindle and stuff because you can still get the books on the Kindle. But there's a lot of people out there, to my surprise, they like to hold the book in their hand when they're reading it. You know, they like that physical paper book, which is I, fine with me. I mean, you know, that's great. But I've always, you know, people have said, you know, I want to read one and two, but I want to read them on paper. Mm. I said, well, the only way you can get one and two is if you buy use a used copy. Okay. And to my surprise, um, a few years back, now number two became the popular. Now the sequel became popular, more popular than the original book. Which was also to my surprise. I was devastated by that. Most of the time, sequels are frowned upon, even in movies and stuff like that. They, people always like the original better than the sequel. But you know, number one came out, and that, I I wasn't going to go on. I wasn't going to go beyond that. I had no idea to go beyond book one because I didn't call it book one. I figured it'd be just a standalone book, and that would be it. So I did it put it out there waiting for reaction to it mm. and i got a lot of positive reaction to it and i had people asking me will there be a second book and at that point in time i said i'm not sure yet because they wanted the story to continue and there was a big event in the story that people were unhappy with and what really got me i mean it blew my mind what I went through with these books. Mm -hmm. The main character in the first book doesn't make it. And I had people very angry with me because that character didn't continue. I mean, I remember reading, you know, I got into the Sherlock Holmes stuff as a young man by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and he had killed off Sherlock Holmes at some point in time in a story called The Final Problem. And I watched documentaries and stuff about it, and people in England were just so angry with him that he killed off Sherlock Holmes. Now, he had reasons for that, but nobody accepted his reasons. Yeah, that, his reasons that was, was that Sherlock Holmes was overshadowing him. You know, they didn't look at him as Conan Doyle. They just looked at him as the author of Sherlock Holmes. Well, he decided he wanted to do other things, so he killed off Holmes. And people were up in arms. You know, they went to his house. They went to the publisher. <laughs> they protested. Sure. And he finally gave in and he wrote a story from the past before he killed him off called mm -hmm. Home of the Baskervilles, which became a very popular story. But it didn't satisfy the public enough. He said, yeah, but we want new stuff. Well, what I understand was an American publisher went to him. And it, this is, we're talking the late 1800s, mm -hmm. when $100 was like $1,000, okay? Mm -hmm. They went to him and they said, Mr. Doyle, we are willing to pay you $10,000 for 10 new Sherlock Holmes stories. Now, back then, $10,000 was like $10 million today. Right. So he thought about it, thought about it, and uh, he finally gave in. He found a way to bring Sherlock Holmes back which inspired me and in how to bring my character back that people wanted. I, I, was I didn't bring him back Jim. as, you know, I, I, my character couldn't come back as a living being, so to speak. He had to come back as something different. And luckily for me, at that point in time, the, the paranormal became very popular. I mean, people looked at the paranormal and said, it's all BS. But all of a sudden, people were like starting to believe in paranormal. There were movies, there were books, there were television shows, Ghost Hunters, Ghostbusters came out. I mean, it was big. Ghosts became something that we should believe in. So I said, okay, maybe I can use that. I can bring back that character as a paranormal character. And I said, it's the most realistic way to do it. Because mm. even though I write fiction, I, I want it to be as real and plausible as possible. Um, so I no. rack my brains. I, I do my homework. <laughs> so I brought the character back in book two as a ghost. 
Mm, mm. which means he's now living his third way of existence. Okay. He starts off as a regular human being like you and I, ends up being a half vampire, and now that's his second way of living as a hybrid human vampire. And now he's back as a ghost. Now, I didn't know how the public would accept it. So I just said, okay, you know, this is best I can do. This is the most realistic way to do it. Mm -hmm. And to make a long story short, it came out. They loved it. They loved that he was back in any shape or form. The character was back in the story. And let me ask you about that. So when you were writing him out of the story in book one, did you have any internal feelings that, oh, I don't know that this is going to be received very well? No, I didn't. I didn't. No, because I realized that if I don't get rid of him, it won't seem as real. Ah. I mean, another thing that blew my mind. Now, at the end of book one, I wrote this little thing. Uh, because, you know, to, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, when he wrote John Carter, the Basum series, the Mars stuff, he was writing the stories from John's memoirs. So I said, you know, if Burroughs can do something like that, and I'll do this. So I did the same thing. I decided to put at the end of the book that, you know, I had more or less found his, because he was, the character was writing his memoirs during the course of the book. And his memoirs play a big part in the series. Mm -hmm. Even though he's gone, his memoirs are alive and well. So I made the statement more or less that I had purchased the memoirs at a yard sale. And wrote the books based on his memoirs. Now, the, the weirdest thing was when people saw that, they asked me quite one question. They said, Jim, how much did you pay for those memoirs? I said, excuse me? <laughs> the memoirs <laughs> that you found at that yard sale. I says, well, it was in a box with a bunch of other stuff. I paid a little bit, bit of money for the box and, and left. Then I looked through the box and I, they said, oh, okay. So... Like, people still believe that Sherlock Holmes lived. Mm -hmm. People believed that maybe the story was real mm -hmm. because of what I said about buying his memoirs and writing the book based on his memoirs. That blew my mind. When somebody said to me, what, what did you pay for the memoirs? I mean, the book is, you know, is pr presented as fiction. Mm -hmm. And even though it says it's fiction... People still want to believe, just like in Sherlock Holmes. They want to believe that Sherlock Holmes really lived. Um, even though he's, he's known throughout the decades as being a fictional character, people will argue with you mm -hmm. that he really existed. Oh, absolutely. He was a living so being. And, you know, I've had debates with people about that. I says, well, to end the arg argument, I said, listen, if you believe that Sherlock Holmes really lived, then you believe Batman really did. <laughs> it's the same thing. So if you're, just the conversation. Tuning in, if you're just tuning in, we're speaking with J.M. Valente. He's celebrity author of Blood Passion. And if you're not sure what that is, let me read a little bit of excerpt. And then J.M. is going to elaborate on that. So it's the memoirs of Michael Valley. His plight with the struggles between the gothic passions of good and horrors of evil, in which innocence is challenged by the thirst for blood of a vampire. How will he escape for the macabre in inner nemesis malice Nightwing? You, the reader, must endure the journey through the blood passion. Tell us more about Michael and the other characters that he uh, interacts with. You had just mentioned in book one, Michael died. And then, you know, you had to bring him back because the readers are like, what? Well, not only, I mean, not, not only, Elizabeth, not only did he die, he was destroyed, utterly mm. destroyed. His body was destroyed. It's like when somebody gets cremated, he was more or less cremated. Mm. So he was, you know, he was dust. There was no way when people demanded he come back, I said to myself, there's no way I can bring him back because he was a living vampire. Not a, He wasn't dead, a living dead. He was a living vampire, just like, Marvel's character Morbius, which they're mm -hmm. re resur resurging, which was done in the 80s. They did the li Morbius, the living vampire, which now they're bringing back, they're bringing him back uh, with a series on Netflix and also a com new comic book for him. He's t it's titled, you know, the, the comic book was titled Morbius, the living vampire. Because most of the time vampires were like the living dead. 
Right. Mm -hmm. But my vampire is, was alive. He was a man. I based it more or less on Jekyll and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. A being that would change from one thing to the other, just like sure. they based the Incredible Hulk on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mm -hmm. It's one being that changes mm -hmm. um, physically and his personality changes. I wanted to do it that way because I didn't want to do Dracula. No. I wanted to do something new. So when people were arguing with me, you know, demanding I bring him back to life somehow, I said to myself, there's no way I could bring him back. Alive. His body is the ashes. He turned into ashes. Right. right. Um, there's no way to regenerate his body because he was a living person. And we know from history of, of death that nobody comes back. Uh, unless they're a ghost. So that triggered it in my mind. I could bring them back as a ghost. And when I did that, I had to research ghost stories hmm. and the way authors depicted ghosts. I didn't agree with a lot of authors the way they did it. Even, you know, in A Christmas Carol, there's diversity in the way they, they show Marley, you know, the ghost hmm. of Jacob Marley. And there's just so much... I was confused because you watch different versions of it and they always show him in a different way. For instance, in one version, he could walk right through Scrooge's bedroom door. Sure. In other versions, the door gets, has to open for him to go in. But yeah, mm -hmm. he's translucent. I said, <laughs> this makes no sense. If he can pass through the door without opening it and then sit on and then he has, they had him sit on the chair. I mm. said, there's no way that a ghost can sit on a chair and not just pass right through the chair. So my ghost of Michael, when he touches something, he can pass through it. But as long as he stays a little bit away from it, he doesn't go through it. In other words, if he hovers above the chair mm -hmm. and the floor mm -hmm. by maybe this much, he won't pass through. But as soon as he goes down and touches the floor, then he can go through it. So have you had any... Wall or something. Have you had so, anyone I mean, comment? That's, yeah, that's... And people, when I did that, people said, it's so realistic that way. I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, if, if, you're, if you're translucent and you can walk through solid objects, how can you sit in a chair? Right. There's no way. You're going to end up going through the chair, through the floor, and whatever. So when you finish well, book two. Well, there has two, to be a way. There has, there has, sorry, Elizabeth, when, you, when you finish book two. Were you 100% yeah. satisfied with how that all came together to be able to bring Michael back? Well, I was satisfied with the way I brought him back, but then I wasn't sure about the public. I said, but I'm giving it, I said, I'm going to give him my best way. My, this was my best effort. Mm -hmm. I gave my best effort to bring him back. And also, you know, I brought him back, but introduced new characters. Because there's, there's a seven year gap between book one and two and there's there's a few reasons for that which is in the story mm -hmm. don't want to give that away but once you, you read it you realize okay now i know why there's seven years between the two the two books i mean it makes sense the problem with it is you know it's book it's up to book four right now there's four books in the series so and to explain the books it gets a little confusing to people uh -huh. because a lot of has a lot has happened a lot of real and the new characters have come in, come in, they go out, they go out and come in. Um, like the character of, of Officer Beth Cooper. Mm -hmm. She's a new character in book four. Mm -hmm. She comes in, does her part, and then she's gone. And I got that idea from, you know, I love the classic authors. Edgar Rice Burroughs, yes. Arthur Conan Doyle, L. Mm -hmm. Frank Baum, Robert E. Howard. I've read them all. I love them. Now, Al Frank Baum's greatest gift to us, that in the 15 books he wrote in the, the Land of Oz, every book had at least one new character introduced. That's what kept me reading them. So I have and a question from himself. a viewer. I have what? a question from a viewer. Michael Schwartz is asking, what inspired you to write Blood Passion? That's, that's a story in itself. <laughs> I wanted to write something about, you know, you get, you get influenced by what you see and what you hear. In the movie um, Animal House, John Belushi is at a frat party. 
And the girl he's with kind of gets drunk and passes out next to him. Now, at that moment, he's undecided what he should do. And all of a sudden, on one shoulder, an angel appears. On the other shoulder, a devil appears. Mm -hmm. And the angel, the devil is telling him, you know, do her, do her. And the angel's going, no, no, that's not nice. Don't. And I wanted to write something that we can all relate to, the battle within us mm -hmm. of the good and evil thoughts mm -hmm. and feelings we have. Now, thankfully, most of us fight off the evil side and go with the good side. Some of us don't which is unfortunate, but I wanted to do it in an entertaining way. I mean, and also I thought about Alfred Hitchcock movies. Mm. And the thing I loved about Alfred Hitchcock movies, he takes this person that is not prepared to go through this situation. So they have to kind of like keep adjusting of how to get through this. Mm -hmm. Every movie you watch of, Sherlock Holmes, of, of Alfred Hitchcock is like that. Right. And unfortunately, his wife never got the credit she deserved. She was the one that took the short stories and made, wrote movies for them. Oh, did I she? I mean, Rear Window is a very short story. Yeah. She got her hands on it. They bought the rights to it. She turned it into a full-blown movie. Hmm. Same with Vertigo and The Birds. And, you know, they're all short stories. His wife was a genius. She could take a short story. I mean, I mean when I say short story, I mean 50 pages. Mm -hmm. She could turn into a full-blown movie. Because I've read the books. You know, you read, you know, It Takes a Thief. Mm -hmm. Or To Catch a Thief. Yeah. And right, the book right. is different than the movie, of course. And I could see where she made changes. Um, I mean, but she was a genius. She was his writer. She was his muse. So tell and us. She never really got the credit she deserved. But I give her full credit. Tell us a little bit about the the newest book, because we didn't talk about that at all in our last podcast. So this would be book four. Has it already released? Yeah, book four is out there. Okay. You can buy it. It, it continues the story from book three. Um, and it's in soft cover and hard cover. What I love about the hard covers, they're laminated. They don't have a dust jacket. Oh, they, that's the nice. Cover you know, it's it's the cover is like this. I I don't I mean the dust jackets are a pain in the neck, and people end up taking them off to read the book. With this, you don't have to. It's I a laminated like that. So cover. Book four, malevolence. What can you tell us without giving the story away, of course? But what can you tell us would be your your most fancied moment? in the story that you personally love? Well, that's hard to do because book four, of course, book four continues from book three. Now, in book two, where I, br I bring Michael back as a ghost, there's also some other characters that are created, that I created. In other words, Michael's offspring oh. comes into the story as a young girl and grows up within the story. I mean, book one only takes about nine months. It's nine months of his life, and that's it. But book two goes a lot longer than that because his offspring, which is kind of a mystery at the beginning, uh, but there's clues to who she really is. You know, she's to the public. She's not Michael's daughter. There's only one person that knows who she really is. And I don't know if a lot of people, a lot of people don't realize this, but now Michael is a male name. It always is, no matter how you use it. Right. And the female name for Michael is not Michelle. No. It's Rachel. Because Michelle can also be a man's name. There's a lot of men in France and in Canada named Michelle. Men. Yeah, yeah. Nostradamus' first name was Michelle. His name was Michelle Nostradamus. Okay. So the main, the, Michelle could be male or female. Mm -hmm. But Michael can be only be male. Female, it's Rachel. If you look at the spellings, and I note that in the story, in a little sequence about the spellings being similar, that's the first hint of who Rachel really is. In other words, she was born female, so her mother didn't name her Michael. She named her something she could, like Rachel. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, because I give that away during the story, that, the, you know, that they're, they're actually almost spelled the same. 
That's the first clue of who she is. The second clue is that she opens up, the story opens up when she's seven years old. And it's been seven years since Michael died or was destroyed. There's another clue. Mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. seven years old. Um, and then Michael's mother comes around because she's trying to find out what happened to her. This is another thing in book two. Um, the anguish that his mother is going through is taken from real life. A friend of my mother's who went through a similar situation, and I witnessed her going through it where her son had disappeared, and she was looking for him but never found him. I'm pretty sure she died before she found out what happened. I don't even know what happened to him. Oh. Um, and I How used to hear her he? talk to my mother because they were childhood friends. How old and the was thing, he? I used to hear her say things, how, you know, she was living in hell, not knowing what happened to her son. Mm -hmm. And she was spending a lot of money trying to find him or find out what happened to him. And unfortunately, she died not knowing. Maybe she oh. knows now. I don't know. But how old was anyway, he? Anyway, I took yeah. from that also with Michael's yeah. mother, because book two opens up with Michael's mother doing her last search for her son. Jim, how old? And I decided was I, will, I will give her. I will give her closure. Jim, so the first person, human being, that Michael's <laughs> ghost appears to is his mother. To try to give her closure. Now he doesn't tell her the truth, and he realizes that because you know you're getting his thoughts as he's thinking. I can't tell her the truth. I have to tell her a lie, mm. one last lie. Mm. So he tells her that. How that he was, you know, he was, he fell off the cliff on the end, at the back of the house because he got he got too little too much to drink. He was alone and he fell off the cliff and died. That's not true, but she accepted it, and it was closure for her. So she decides to sell this house that her father had given to her her son. So she decides to sell the house, which brings in the, the buyers are new characters in the story. Now. Yeah, book two is, it's, it's, it's complex, but it's not confusing. You really have to read it to understand what's going on. So Michael comes back as a ghost. Rachel is introduced as a young girl, but she grows up to be a teenager. So at the, at the end of the book, she's 19 years old. And in the meantime, the people that buy the house, who have, inter, you know, have something to do with what's happened to Michael, and they actually... The evil that did this to him gets re resurrected mm -hmm. by the owner, the own, the new, the new owner. Her husband is foolish enough to, to his curiosity, you know, resurrects the evil that that would happen to Michael. So this evil happens to her wife, his wife. So in the second book, you have two vamp two hybrid vampires. You have Rachel who inherited from wow. her father, and then you have the new owner of the house, Malena. Who gets who becomes a vampire the same way Michael did, and she's going through the same thing of having the two personalities, and she gives her other personality a name. Um, she picks menace, mm -hmm. where Michael picked malice. I mean, and she goes through the same thing, and and also the the kicker is this: this woman is Rachel's godmother. Oh, interesting! She's a childhood friend of Rachel's Rachel's mother. They grew up together, more or less. Uh -huh. So she became Rachel's godmother. But that being said, they're rival vampires. They don't, you know, they don't want to share the, the area. So there's con this, this, this conflict between them. It's so um, interesting godmother because and godchild with all the and twists and, and turns, it, it's so very interesting. It, it sounds a lot like with the family of vampires, and of course they're interacting with normal uh, humans who are not vampires. It's like this soap opera saga. There's so many moving parts to it. Think about think about the Dark Shadows television show. Yes, loved it. It started out as a show about the Collins family. Mm. Okay? And, you know, it became a little too boring and was starting to lose it. And actually, the, the creator, Dan Curtis, went to his, his teenage daughters and said, what can I do? He said, Dad, bring in the supernatural. Bring in a ghost or a vampire or a werewolf or something. So once he brought in Barnabas Collins to interact with these regular people, the show went through the ceiling. The ratings went super high. 
And Bottomus Collins is more or less what I use for my vampire, only it's a younger version. Mm, mm. In Dark Shadows, Bottomus Collins, normally he looks like a regular person. You mm -hmm. wouldn't know he's a vampire unless he wants to take your blood. Because <laughs> that's when his fangs will show and he'll take your blood. And the way he did it with 60s television, he was very restricted on how he could do things. Sure. So they didn't want him, his victims to die. And they didn't want his victims to become vampires. What his victims became was subservient to him, the Barnabas. They became like his slaves. But they weren't vampires. This is a television show. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, I read into it. I watched the interviews with him and how he got his ideas and everything. And he was an amazing man. Very creative. I mean, he could take a rock and make you believe it was a mountain. <laughs> For instance... Dark Shadows began one way. He went to sleep one night and had a dream about a young girl traveling at night on a train from Boston to Bangor, Maine. He woke up from the dream and he said to his wife, I just had the strangest dream. And he told his wife and he said, his wife said, do something with it, Dan. Mm -hmm. He said, what can I do with that? He did Dark Shadows from that. It opens up where this girl is going up to Maine to be a governess. She's on a train traveling at night. From this little obscure dream he had, he created a phenomenon. The television show is still showing somewhere on the planet. You can mm -hmm. buy all the DVDs of every show there was. There's interviews. There was there con there were conventions until most of the actors, you know, got too old, so they stopped. Right. Yes, it was a very I mean, long running series. It was, it was a phenomenon. It. I mean, and then, you know, they, he actually did a full-blown movie of Dark Shadows himself with MGM, mm -hmm. which he had more freedom to do what he wanted to do. But this latest version with Johnny Depp is a travesty. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to get too far into it. No, I, I don't want to do that, but, but they, they but kept it up. Me... They made it like the television Batman. I'm like, you know. <laughs> that's that's a little odd, isn't it? Let me ask you this question. If someone would like to uh, maybe get onto your email list or follow you and the creation of the next book to come, what is the best way to get onto your email list? Well, usually in the books. You? At the end of the... Let me see here. At the end. Because so, now in, in book four, you get two chapters of book five, which isn't published yet. Ooh, I give you a preview. That's, I give that's you a two-chapter preview of book five. Mm. Now, at the end of the story, before the book five preview starts, I there's my email address. Okay. It says, J. M. Valenti's Blood Passion Novel Series, book one, two, and three. Contact information, email, and my email is there. Now, that was before I, got, I, I did volume one. In so the meantime, you know, people book, they, they got this, they were reading it, they read the first two chapters of book five, which isn't out yet, so they're chopping it a bit for that. But I told them, I said, you're going to have to wait. And that's the best way. You know yourself, you're in show business. You don't give it all away, okay? <laughs> Up front. You, you make people like kind of like wait a little bit, you know, and anticipate what's coming. It's like with movies, they do a sequel. You don't see the sequel. It doesn't I mean they're coming out closer than ever before, but... It sometimes usually took years for a sequel to come up. And people yes. were always waiting and waiting and anticipating a sequel. And when they finally realized there was going to be one, they went crazy. Like, oh, my God, I can't wait. I can't wait. If you give the people everything all at once, it spoils the excitement. All right. And I thought about that when I did cry. create Volume 1. Volume 1 was done because... People were wanting to read one and two in, in print copy. Mm -hmm. And out of respect for my first fans who had bought one and two when it was available, um, I said, I'm not going to reproduce them exactly the way they were reproduced. I want to do it in a different way because I don't want to take away from the value of those first books. And speaking of value, three years ago, almost four now, Mm, yes. And I still have the screenshot. There were two vendors using Amazon to sell books. Mm -hmm. and they were they were actually they were selling book two print copy used. They were asking a thousand dollars a copy. 
That a is friend of mine insane. called me up what and he said, think? Jim, go on Amazon. See what's going on. So I go on Amazon. He says, I says, yeah, book two. He goes, he goes there's somebody selling it. for." Oh, it's, I says, it's not me. They're pricing it at $1,000 for a copy. Now, I don't know if they got it. Okay. But I was flattered. I mean, wow. I had people, I had people who, you know, are asking me, is the book that good? It's worth a thousand dollars. I says, that's a, that's a, that's a funny question to ask me. I said, yeah, because don't I think it's that, that good. <laughs> but, um, and they said, you know, I can't afford a thousand dollars. I said, I know you can't. Yeah. I says, what you need to do is wait till I can reproduce it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I will reproduce it in a different way. That's what I came up with volume one. In the comic book world, they will take a comic book that continues like in six issues. And after time goes by, they turn that into what they call a trade paperback. So all those six issues are in one volume. Yes. So you can continuously read one through whatever or such and such through such and such a number for that entire story, story um, uh, arc. Yeah. Which it sells, they sell like crazy because I have a friend of mine who owns a comic book store. He says, I can't keep trade pay paperbacks on the shelf. I says, well, to buy those six, those six copies that are in there individually will cost you a lot of money as back mm -hmm. issues. But to buy the trade paperback is a big savings, which is what happens in volume one. So to buy one, two, bit... and three, one, two, and three separately, if you can get your hands on them, mm -hmm. would cost a lot more than buying this. And how much is volume one? Volume one, the paperback version, right now, it's about, it's, I think it's at, um, last time I checked Amazon. Let me check. It changes day to day. Okay. I but it's certainly it. not $1,000. Let's say that. I much. usually <laughs> check it. <laughs> well, and it's easy. I mean, it's easy to find. I mean, you go on Amazon, you punch in Blood Passion Volume One. That's right. And the title is like nobody else uses the title Blood Passion. They may no. use blood, they may use passion, but I more or less own the title Blood Passion. So when you type in Blood Passion, mm -hmm. you type in Blood Passion, you're going to find it anywhere. If you'd like a copy of the book, you can go to Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, walk into your local bookstore anywhere and say, I need J.M. Valente's blood passion series all right jim so how much is that volume one all right right now blood passion on amazon volume one the kindle is 649 the hard cover is 2574 and the paperback is 1874 mind it you're getting three plus books yeah that because you're getting the three, one two three and then you're getting the three chapter prequel that takes you back to the beginning Ooh. That's another thing that people were, were asking me about. What are you going to do? Because, you know, it hits, the story begins, it hits the ground running. It's not really explained. It just opens up. Mm -hmm. And I never go back. It's like what they did. Batman came out. He was Batman. The first issue, for, he was Batman. Later on, they did his origin. Issues later, they did an origin for him. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, people were asking, you know, we want to know how he got started. So, Bob Kane decided, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write his origin, which he had never done for the first, like, 30 issues. And people loved it. You know, now they had the origin of the Batman. Well, this story doesn't have an origin until you read the prequel. And it's only a three-chapter prequel. I love it. Um, so is book it five how, it, it? Will book five be it? Is that the end? I've already started book six. Ah, so where, what, what book have you already determined that's as far as it goes, or, or have you not even determined that? Well, let's put it this way: your and my friend Ken Dodge wants twelve issues. <gasps> twelve? You tell me, I want to see you write twelve books of blood Twelve? That's, I, that's, I, I did the same thing you just did. Twelve. Twelve. What? I mean, I, it's like I said, the way I determine is, as long as people want more, I'll write more. As soon as somebody says, you know, the, the masses say, that's enough, I've had enough, then I'll stop. And as long <laughs> as I can bring, make, keep it fresh, I mean, you got to keep it fresh. And right. I did what Al Frank Baum did. I keep it fresh by bringing in new characters in each book, along with the old ones. Mm -hmm. Sort of like Game of Thrones is successful because of that, because you know, they kill off characters and bring in new ones. That goes way back to L. Frank Baum in the 1900s. 
of the way he wrote his series. You know, getting rid of characters or putting them in the background and bringing in new ones. That's an old way of doing it. And Game of Thrones is successful because of that. Because of L. Frank Baum, you know, it's successful because of the, he's, they've adopted, he's adopted the way L. Frank did it, you know. Sure. Which I accommodate him for. And the man had an unbridled imagination. Oh, and Hollywood yeah. has not really done anything, enough of his work. So they let did me ask recently, you this. They did one about yeah. you know, the Wizard of Oz going to, going to Oz before Dorothy came into it, which actually took in a lot of the books. When I watched it, I, I said, okay, because I read all 15 books, and I started to see some of the other books come in. Mm. And I said, okay, finally. And don't, people, what people don't realize is the Wizard of Oz was written for adults. It's a horror story. Mm. Yeah, Hollywood, took, Hollywood grabbed it. it, you know, they took hold of it and they made it a musical children's story. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if I tell people, read the book, yeah, and you will be amazed how different the story is. Yeah, that's a good point. And Let me ask you this if someone wanted to get a signed copy of their book, a signed how, copy, yeah, how do they go about getting the celebrity Hancock? Well, let's put it this way. I don't have a lot of copies left, okay? And I'm trying to hold on to some for my own collection. Like, for instance, this is, a, I'll tell you something. These were done before the publisher went out of business. Pocket size, one and two. Oh, wow. Right? Pocket wow. size. Because this is, you know, this is your normal size for a book. This is the pocket size. Wow. These were done before the publisher went out of business and I acquired some copies of it. Okay. But you talk about rare. There's no way you could get these mm -mm. Mm -mm. online or in a bookstore. There's just no way you can order a pocket size one and two. As far okay. as the public is concerned, they don't exist. So let's but say... These, these are my copies. Ah, do you have any that more that if, if somebody bought book four... And they got your email address, which is in the back of book four. And they right. said, can I buy one of your copies? Could they do that? Yeah, well, let's put it this way. I have two sets of volume one and number four in my collection. I'm willing wow. to sell. Uh, and if somebody would buy them, you know, I would sell them for a reasonable price plus shipping. And I'd sign them, of course, and send them a few trinkets. Like, you know, I have, I had these I made up. These. This is a postcard. Yeah. These are bookmarks, customized bookmarks. I would send these along, which you wouldn't get from Amazon. No, of course not. Yeah, I'm willing to do that. I mean, if somebody really wants it, and I'm not talking about thousands of dollars here. I mean, I'd look at the price on Amazon, the going price, and I'd say, okay, I, I want to get at least that much and a little more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For the shipping cost. Mm -hmm. The shipping this book, I mean, this is a big book. This is over 500 pages. Okay? Wow. But that's not cheap books. to ship this. That's, huh? that's three volumes. That's volume volume one. Right, right. Three and books. And this is the hard, the hard cover is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It really the is. The hard cover of volume one is, it's a laminated hard cover. I mean, it's just gorgeous. It is. So, and may it, I this ask was actually you going. Originally going for forty one dollars oh, on wow. Amazon. Right now it's at eighteen seventy three. That's a bargain and a half. That is. That's a huge. You're getting bargain. three books, plus the prequel. The prequel's at the end. Can I ask you, you know, a question finished, finished, about being an author? And, you know, I've had a lot of people write in and they're asking about, you know, Elizabeth, do you know anyone that is a talent agent for writers? Or I have this book that's written now. What do I do with it? Well, of course, I, I, not yet. I don't have any of my books published. So I guess this is a little bit of my question as well. Have you ever thought about putting together an online class to teach people the do's and don'ts? of being a self-published author? No, I never thought of it. But I was going to show you that at the end of the book, there's the, the title page for the prequel. Ooh. And there's a few hints right on the page. There's the bat, 
and is a flying saucer. Huh. This is the origin of the evil that gets into Michael's life. So right away, you look at the title page and you go, okay, there's a bat flying over a flying saucer. And that, you know, people are like, oh, my God, I got to read this. <laughs> what's, a, what's a flying saucer thing, you know? Sure. I mean, I love to generate curiosity in people. Make, I, get, I love to get people excited. And I've had people say, you know, when I saw that title page, I saw the bat, of course, and then I saw the flying saucer. Right away, their brain starts going, what, what's this with flying saucer? Oh, my God. <laughs> so you get into the story. It's only three chapters. Real quick read, and it ends where book one begins. Okay. I mean, that's what I mean. The stories, yeah, I love telling the story, but I also, I love the, I love, um, you know, inspiring people's curiosity. I love killing, getting people curious. Sure. I was in sales for thirty years, selling food, and the best way to sell something is with curiosity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We human beings, one of our faults is curiosity. You know, the old saying, curiosity killed the cat. Right. It's true. I mean, a lot of people get, I've gotten in trouble because of my curiosity. You know, you, you go, you go into something you, you have no mind, you, you shouldn't because you're curious about it. But to make people curious is the first foot in the door. Mm -hmm. So a good salesperson uses curiosity. You look at a billboard and it doesn't quite explain what, that product is so all of a sudden you're correct going, what's this all about so then you go online you go okay i saw this billboard with this on it you type it in, oh that's what it is your curiosity got you to look into it which means they got their foot in the door right and you it may be something you want so i've always used curiosity when i was in food service if i had a new product coming mm -hmm. i would make up a flyer but hopefully a picture of the co of the, the product. Sure, yeah. And I'd pass it out to my customers. And I wouldn't give much information. I said, you know, mm -hmm. coming soon. There's such and such a product. Mm -hmm. And I get people to say to me, what's this all about you? I said, it's something I'm taking on. Uh, you know, I don't know if you want it. Well, I want to know more information about it. So I give more information. They go, okay, put me down for some. I mean, nine out of ten times, I sold it that way. Oh, wow. And then it had to it had to go out on its own. In other words, if they tried it and they like it, they'd keep buying it. And I also, in selling food, I always told people that if I won't eat it, I won't sell it. Yeah, the vendors true. would always give me a sample. And I'd take it home and I'd eat it, cook it, whatever, and try it. If I liked it, I'd take it on. Mm -hmm. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I would tell, I was very honest with people. I said, you know, I tried it, I didn't like it. It didn't taste right. <laughs> oh, okay, Jim. We'll stick with the one you've, you've given us. Okay. So, I mean, 30 years I did that. And you don't, you know, you don't last 30 years without being trusted by people. Right. People absolutely. trusted in more ways than one. Um, I mean, 30 years tells you right there that I was a trusted person. I was a trusted, honest businessman. Now, I was ridiculed for that. My Very fellow good. vendors, my fellow vendors said to me, Jim, you'll never get rich being honest. I mm -hmm. said, hey, I can live with that. I, I disagree with that. I think honesty, especially in today's world right now, goes a long, long way. Um, I'm I'm an entrepreneur, as we all know. It it's, goes uh, beyond this show. And um, two of our other businesses, you know, honesty is really what keeps us very reputable. It keeps us uh, wealthy. So I'm going to stay in the honest lane. And I love to see how you applied your background in marketing and sales into book four. You're giving everybody a sample of book five. Uh, Jim, I want to thank you so much for your time. This has been a wonderful show. You've really gotten us caught up to speed and, and everybody go get the book. Like you can't get his information unless you buy book four. So yeah, and I also tell people that, you know, people should actually read the sample on Amazon. You should click to look inside and read the sample yes. before you spend any money. Okay. If you like the sample, okay. Good. Continue. If you don't, maybe pass it on to someone you think may like it. That's how I. That's how I sell my books. I sell the idea of people buying the book. Don't buy the book. Read the sample first. Sure. Amazon gives you the opportunity to read a sample. Mm -hmm. Use it. Do it. Now, if you have a Kindle, you can download a sample. 
Right. It costs Absolutely. Nothing. Well, I, I want to thank you for your time. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, dear. Thank you so much. Come on back over to the show. You know, maybe book six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We got a long <laughs> way to go. So yeah. we'll see you again. Ken, Ken Dodge wants 12. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you got a lot more books to write. <laughs> so Yeah, I know. But I have to keep it fresh, too. I don't want it to get boring. No, of course But not. like I said at the beginning, as long as people want more, I'll do more. All right. Good In deal. Words, people, they read, they read number four. They go, okay, when's five coming out? Yeah, yeah. And if they read five, when five comes out, if they read that, they, they say to me, when six coming out, then I'll, you know, like I've already started six. I've got the first two chapters of six done. And in book five, the story takes, it takes a change at the end of book three. But in book five, the story takes a very shocking change. Mm. A shock. I mean, my beta reader was shocked. Oh, I can't. She wait. read the end of the manuscript and she got back. She says, Oh my God, you blew me away. I can't. So we wait. Talking about, she goes, The way you ended that book. I said, Yeah. You didn't like it? She goes, No, I loved it. <laughs> but I was like blown away. I was like, Oh my God. You know? Oh, that's and fantastic. It it's all, and it's all fiction. It's not something that really happened. But I think fiction has its own, fiction is entertaining. Oh, it is. It Nonfiction really is. can be entertaining, but also can be very sad. You know, yes. real life is, you know, not always fun. No, absolutely fiction not. But you entertain like, us, it's, it's, and we love. It's like your playing books. a video game, right? A video game, people die, they get destroyed, but you know it's not real, so it's kind of entertaining. Right. You're watching these characters die because you know they really didn't. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, thank like you so movie, much. You know, when you, we yeah. really appreciate the time today. And everybody, okay. get out there. Go buy the the volume of book one, two, three, book four, and be ready for book five very soon. Jim, have a wonderful day, and we'll talk to you very soon. You take care, too. Stay healthy. Thank you so much. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Oh my goodness, that was a wonderful story. I always love chatting with uh, Julian Bolette. You can find him on Facebook as Jim Bolette. Then we are going to be back in just a moment with Pastor He has so many partners in the world that can go over to find you. Go look up Bill Housekeeper. It's spelled exactly the way that you're going to go. And all these movies and TV shows he has in the works. It's unbelievable. So, we're going to be talking to him up next. Oh, we'll double check that. Okay. Oh, on the roster. Yep. Bill Housekeeper at 2 p.m. today. We'll see you in just a moment. We are blessed. You are blessed. Not 